Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Zechner. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions at Rutgers in the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative. And I'm here to talk to you today about recovery and that is helping people with mental health conditions live beyond their symptoms. I'm really happy to be talking to you about this topic that's very important to me. So I wanna start out by going over who we are and what we do. Uh, the SHPRI is a long-term affiliation between Rutgers and the State Psych Hospitals of New Jersey. And our mission is listed and we are aiming to use psych rehab goals, values, and principles in current research to implement and improve the quality of care at the system. We are funded through the New Jersey Department of Health and we're very grateful for their support and they make these videos possible. So we extend our gratitude to them. The goals for today, to define recovery, to think about the skills and attitudes we need to help people recover, to think about the skills and attitudes that people living with mental health conditions need to recover, and also to give you some reflective questions to consider how recovery oriented practices are implemented or are challenged in your setting. So first of all, let's talk about what's mental health recovery. And mental health is, recovery is very personal. It's so personal. It's a unique way of changing attitudes, values, feelings, goals, and roles. It's about living a satisfying and hopeful life in spite of the illness. And that can be really challenging when someone's dealing with psychiatric symptoms. Um, so I always think about it as a little bit different. It's kind of similar to recovery from a medical illness and substance use, but it's a little bit different too, because there, there is sort of an ebb and flow. And with a medical diagnosis, you aren't always a com completely changed by the experience. And often for people living with mental health conditions, it really is a changing experience for them. So let's talk about a little bit what recovery is, and it's about living well. So I talk a lot about wellness and thinking about wellness in a lot of different areas and not just physical health, but also social wellness and occupational wellness and spiritual wellness. So having a life that's balanced and healthy, also having good social supports, friends, family, community connections, being involved in one's community skipping ahead a little bit. <laughs> it's also deeply personal. So what recovery looks like for one person is really different than another person. Recovery is often creating new meaning and person uh, purpose for the individual. So what what it means to be who they are and how they are is often very much changed. When you talk to people who are in recovery, they tell you, my life used to be like this, and now it's like this, and it took me a while to get from there to here. And as I mentioned, recovery is also about being in the community. So making sure that people are a full part of their communities and not just living in hospitals or living in specialized housing for people with mental health conditions. There are some concepts that are really critical to recovery. And the first is having hope. As mental health providers, the most important thing we can do is have hope that the person can get better. A lot of times people lose their hope and literally we have to be the hope holders for that person while they're experiencing symptoms and they're maybe waiting for medications to kick in and they're really not feeling very well. Our role a lot of times as supporters is to remind people, you know, you feel like this today, but I know you're going to get better. And I know that tomorrow is another day. And with time, you will feel more yourself. It's also about encouraging a person to take personal responsibility. So if we manage to do everything for someone with a mental health condition, like tell them what to eat, when to eat, you know, provide the food um, and tell them how to, to live their lives, then that sort of takes away the opportunity for the person to experience what that means for themselves. 
So it's important to offer opportunities for personal responsibility because that's really, really who we are as individuals. We all want to live our own lives. We don't want someone to tell us when to go to bed, what to eat, um, and how to live our lives. Recovery also includes education, and that can be education about what the diagnosis means, what medications are uh, recommended, what coping strategies are needed. It can also mean education in terms of skills training, helping someone learn uh, new social skills to connect with others, all kinds of different education. Also, recovery is about self-advocacy and making sure that a person can get the things they need, the treatment they need, the services, uh, resources that they need in the community to live that life uh, as they want to live. Finally, peer support is really invaluable to recovery and peer support is when someone who has a mental health condition and has recovered is now working a lot of times or sometimes it's volunteer. Our uh, peer supporters work in a variety of different places and they help people and they part of their help is that they share their own stories of hope and recovery with other people who are struggling. And I have to say, I've, I've witnessed it and it's very, very powerful. Peer support is a critical component to recovery for sure. Now, I know I am in academia and you're thinking, oh no, she's whipping out the research. I kind of have to, I would be terrible. I would be remiss <laughs> if I didn't include some examples of, uh, from the literature. So here are some really important studies about recovery from schizophrenia. And the, the point that's really important to notice here is that these studies were longitudinal, which means they took a long time. They were over, you know, between 20 and 35 years. And it basically found that over time, people with schizophrenia did recover. Does it mean that they no longer had schizophrenia? No, it didn't mean that. It meant that they were able to function well enough in their communities with and sometimes without medication that they were able to uh, live independently, that they were able to uh, live the, really the life that they had chosen for themselves. And roughly about 50% consistently were able to recover over time. And I think that's really, really powerful and a message that we need to send to people that people can and do recover and be the hope bearers for people. It's really important though to remember that recovery is a journey and they've got this picture of a road going up a mountain and it's sideways and it's like a snake. Um, and you notice it isn't straight because sometimes people do really, really well and wow, they got a job, they're, you know, working, full-time, they went back to school, they started dating again, and oh my gosh, there's a lot of pressure and stress. And so then they slide back downhill and then they have to get back on that road and go up again. So recovery looks different for each individual because everybody's story is very different. And the only way that we'll know what helps a person is if we talk to them and we uh, sit with them and really understand where they're coming from, uh, from and try to encourage them. So what can we do? There are things we could do that support recovery. The first is to really learn their story. As I mentioned, having a person orientation. Don't imagine that one person is the same as the next person, but Michelle is Michelle and she has her unique strengths and challenges, uh, just like you are each uh, bringing your own strengths and challenges. And all of our clients, service recipients, patients, consumers, peers, how whatever language we wanna use, people are individuals. We also really have to encourage uh, the people that we help to make their own choices and involvement, even when they're not well, to encourage them to make health choices, to make choices about housing, because that's, a, that's really important to sense of individualism and sense of being an adult. And also we have to be respectful. I always think, you know, I am a family member and I always think um, when I see someone who's experiencing a lot of symptoms in the moment, that that could be my family member. Um, 
underneath all of that stuff that's going on in their in their mind in the moment and i try to remember that that's someone's son that's someone's brother that's someone's friend and they're just having a really hard time in that moment and i find that people who are experiencing symptoms will will respond to that so they connect with you and they can tell if, if you're being disrespectful even if someone's very very symptomatic also focusing on strengths you know try to find What's that person good at? Maybe they're a really good artist or maybe they can sing beautifully or maybe they used to work in a, as an accountant. Um, so anything is possible, but we need to know what people are good at, not just what their problems are. We also have to support po hope, as I've been saying, and positivity for the future as well as growth potential, meaning that the person can grow beyond this difficult situation, maybe even use this difficult situation they're in in the moment to get better and find new meaning and purpose in their life. Recovery from institutions. Well, what does it mean to recover if you're incarcerated or in the hospital? And that takes time. I spend a lot of time in the psychiatric hospitals and I see people who give up. They just sort of say, I, I'm sort of powerless. I'm going to let you take over. Um, and we really have to work hard as mental health staff to help them move towards growth and empowerment. And, you know, there have been studies that look at the number one thing that helps people recover from mental illness. Can you guess what that is? The number one thing that ha actually helps people recover is supportive staff. So we are all the number one reason that people uh, are recovering. So it's important that we remember that every day in our work. You are an amazing source of strength and support to people. We can also be a barrier to recovery if you think about it. And that makes sense, right? If we don't treat people with respect, if we um, don't give them choices, or if we don't have hope for them, then why would they have hope for themselves? So always remember that, that you're a very powerful person in the role in recovery for someone. What do we need to have for recovery? We have to be a little bit optimistic and hopeful. I mean, that's the word of the day, right? Hope. Um, but also we have to believe that people with mental illness can learn and grow and get beyond the current uh, symptoms that they're experiencing. We also need to seek new knowledge about recovery. So reading books, reading testimonials, asking NAMI to come in. The In Our Own Voice program is wonderful to learn more about the peer perspective. Also being non-judgmental. It's it can be challenging when we hear some you know odd stories and stuff from people, but not necessarily, you know, what would work for me might not work for, for, for the person that I'm helping. So remembering that and always remember that recovery is possible. Some skills that we might need to support recovery. Now, things like motivational interviewing, which is a way to talk to people if they're thinking about a change. And that's a really great, a great skill. And I know that um, we have some videos on that. Also, learning more about goal exploration, goal setting and uh, accomplishing goals. Goal setting is key to uh, helping people recovery. Also reflective listening, being able to really sit and listen to what someone says. Sometimes what I see, and I don't know, I, sometimes I have that problem too, is when I'm interacting with someone, I really want to give them advice. Like, gosh darn, I, you know, I read all these books. I want to tell people about that, the information and knowledge I have. But sometimes what you really need and I need, we all need to do is listen, listen to people. Um, listening is powerful. Also helping people reframe difficult situations so that instead of like, I'm never going to get out of the hospital or I'm always going to be uh, sort of on the streets or I'm always going to be looking for uh, a good apartment. Maybe it's, you know, the reframe is that you are incredibly tenacious and you have some amazing advocacy skills and you are going to get this. Um, so don't forget to remind people of their strengths when their challenges are available. Also, being able to problem solve sort of step by step, um, breaking things down into smaller pieces. We're going to talk about psychiatric rehabilitation, which is my field. And we, we talk about some of these technologies uh, in psych rehab because we see it as sort of, you know, 
a big thing and then making it into small things. And that helps with problem solving a lot. Also, the ability to teach skills. I don't know if anyone's taught a social skills training group, but that's really a challenge sometimes to get people to come up and um, practice their social skills in a group. So getting better at our group skills and skills training is really important for recovery. And finally, to be able to build a collaboration with the person that you're helping and supporting and a partnership with them, seeing them as equals and not as uh, sort of, up, you know, I'm, I'm the expert and here's the person who is going to be fixed. We can't fix people with recovery. They have to fix, you know, more or less they have to do the work and, and that takes time sometimes. So what do clients need? I was talking a lot about what staff need, but, but clients need some, some things too, or people receiving services. They have to be willing to accept help. And that is, uh, that's a challenge. I think it's a challenge for many of us. Uh, and that's no different for people living with a mental health condition. It's also about taking action and being willing to get unstuck. Um, you know, mental illness and psychiatric symptoms are, are challenging. And that's sometimes those side effects, you know, like if you think about depression, uh, people get very stuck and it's very hard to get unstuck. Also for our service recipients, you know, positive routines are really important. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, getting up at a certain time, going to bed at a certain time, eating three meals a day, brushing your teeth, going to the doctor, uh, going shopping once a week, just sort of taking care of those everyday things that seem kind of unimportant, but actually help keep us grounded and in our homes. We I also have to ask our clients to challenge their institutional thinking. So they may have been in the system a long time, and I've seen that in some older adults in the hospitals, where they just, they've just given up. And we have to ask them to say, you know what? It's, it's your life. What do you want with your life? And keep encouraging them to think about the choices that they want um, and encourage them to think about problem solving, maybe even shared decision making. We also have to work with people to promote self-acceptance. So recovery is about accepting the situation and growing and moving beyond that diagnosis, moving beyond that episode and empowerment. So giving people back their own power. So thinking about where you work, what are the barriers to using recovery values there? And then on the flip side, what are some examples of supporting recovery where you work? And I know when I am working in the hospital, sometimes I see the challenges that people are rushed, they're trying to get their work done, and sometimes that means it's a little bit harder to really listen to people um, or support recovery. And yet at the same time, in the hospitals, I also see some amazing examples of staff encouraging uh, the person served to get jobs, to reconnect with their family, to reconnect to their hobbies. So I, I see some amazing work both ways. But it's important to think about what's happening around you and how can we support recovery. And I'd like for you to think about a new practice, skill, or attitude that might make you better at supporting recovery for people you work with. Is there something that you could do that we've talked about today that might support recovery? So again, just to recap, recovery is really about helping people make contributions to their communities and to their families. It's about living with purpose and meaning. It's about overcoming difficulties and challenging and rediscovering the self. I've asked you some reflection questions, so I encourage you to take, <laughs> take those on of something that you might want to do a little bit differently. And remember that recovery from mental illness is possible. Staff are very important to recovery. We've got to have hope and the right skills and attitudes are needed both from staff and from the person served. I have a couple of resources here if you want to learn more and some references. Thank you so much for your time.